Okay, I've got noon on my watch. And so out of respect to everyone who is here, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, thank you so much for joining us for our fourth diversity health series session of the year. We are so thankful to have Dr. Toby Freshholtz and Denise Rubenfeld from our OBGYN department here talking today with us about racial disparities along the reproductive continuum. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we get started, and then I will go ahead and introduce our wonderful speakers and turn it over to them. Um, as you probably got the little note we are recording this session um, and we will make the slides available to anyone who requests them afterwards. Um, we will put them up on the Office of Diversity and Inclusion website. Um, if you have questions along the way, we ask that you um, type them into the chat and then our speakers will address the questions um, when they're finished with their presentation. Um, if you are needing continuing medical education credits, um, Dr. Doherty will put the link in the chat and I will turn it over to her just to let us know how that works. Of course, thank you, Dr. Jacobs. Yes, for CMEs, towards the end of the presentation, I will be putting in the directions, a link for those, and also a link for the evaluation in and of itself. Once you've completed the CME evaluation, at the very end of that evaluation, you will find the activity code. So do make sure to jot that down. And once you hit submit for the evaluation, you will be directed right over to the CME portal. That way you can go ahead and log into your account and get credit for this activity. If you have any questions about the process or have any difficulty along the way with that, please feel free to contact me via email and I will also add my email to the chat as well. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. All right, now I get to introduce our wonderful speakers. Um, so first of all, we have Dr. Toby Freshholt. She was born and raised locally right here in North Lake Tahoe, and she attended UNR for her undergraduate, her graduate, as well as for medical school. She completed her residency in OBGYN um, at the Kaiser Permanente site in Santa Clara, California, where she was the recipient of the Arnold P. Gold Foundation Award for Humanism and Excellence in Teaching, uh, which that doesn't surprise me. Um, and this award recognizes residents for their humanism and for exemplary teaching of medical Shortly after finishing her training, she elected to return home to the Reno-Tahoe area, and she is currently providing comprehensive evidence-based and compassionate um, health care um, here at the Reno VA. Her, her professional interests include pelvic pain and pelvic floor disorders. She's excited to be back in, in her hometown in the mountains where she can enjoy trail running, skiing, hiking, biking, and relaxing with her dog. Um, thank you, Dr. Freshholtz, for joining us today. We are also very lucky to have Denise Rubenfeld, who completed her nurse uh, midwifery training in 2011. She was awarded her Master of Science by the University of California, San Francisco. Um, called to the mountains as well, she began practicing in Reno in 2013. Throughout her career as a certified nurse midwife, she has taught medical students, nursing students, and family medicine residents. She was thrilled to combine her passions for teaching and clinical care when she joined UNR Med uh, Women's Health in 2018. She has served as president of the Nevada affiliate of the American College of Nurse Midwives. Her special interests include um, perinatal mental health, uh, reproductive justice, eliminating health disparities, and yoga for pelvic floor health. She is Spanish speaking and she loves to travel. And during her free time, she enjoys exploring the trails of Reno and Tahoe with her family, friends, and with her dogs. Um, please help me virtually welcome Dr. Freshholtz and Denise Rubenfeld. And I turn it over to you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Dr. Freshholtz, and um, the first thing I want to say is that I really wish I was using one of those cat filters. I think that would make this a lot easier. <laughs> um, Denise and I today are going to talk about the racial disparities along the reproductive continuum. Um, I will begin with an emphasis on family planning, and then Denise will talk more about pregnancy and maternal health. Um, I just want to say that before we begin, we do wish to point out the obvious fact that we are two white women giving this presentation. 
uh, we're not here to speak for others, but rather to point out issues in our past and current systems and policies that make them inequitable. And we do feel that as white providers, that is our job. So we're gonna start by going to our learning objectives. We are going to define racial disparities in healthcare, identify disparities in access to reproductive healthcare, including contraception and abortion care, describe current policies and their role in limiting access to reproductive services, and describe the effect the above barriers to access have on women, families, and society. According to the Howard University School of Law, racial disparity refers to the imbalances and incongruities between the treatment of racial groups, including economic status, income, housing options, societal treatment, safety, and a myriad of other aspects of life and society. One can discuss racial disparities across any measure. We are here to discuss racial disparities in healthcare, specifically reproductive healthcare. Any discussion of reproductive health care must start with a discussion of reproductive autonomy. This is the power for a woman to decide when, if at all, to have children. Um, and this is really central to women's welfare because both childbearing takes place in women's bodies and because they are generally expected to take primary responsibility for child rearing. When and if someone decides to start a family, they should be able to do so with dignity on the timeline that meets their needs and with affordable, equitable access to care. What is required for reproductive autonomy? The first is some level of education. So some understanding of how our bodies work, some knowledge of sexual health, but also some um, ability to access um, the services that are available. And access to healthcare and services is often dependent on employment and health insurance and the availability of clinics locally that provide services and transportation. And there are racial disparities that exist that affect access to healthcare. So one is, you know, historical historic um, unequal access to, un to educational and employment opportunities. Um, policies such as redlining have um, caused stark and persistent racial disparities in wealth, which have forced people of color into certain neighborhoods where these um, um, services may or may not be available. Also prior, um, Interactions with the healthcare system may have created negative perceptions of the healthcare system, a distrust of physicians, and certainly a segregated healthcare workforce. So, if a uh, woman of color presents for contraceptive care, for instance, it's pretty unlikely that she's going to be met with a provider that looks like her. So, reproductive justice goes hand in hand with racial economic and health justice. And one of the major barriers that um, we'll talk about is access to care and health insurance really increases access. Um, health insurance helps patients, especially in the US, enter the healthcare system, get the healthcare they need, avoid large and often unanticipated medical bills. Um, health insurance saves lives. So research has demonstrated that thousands of premature deaths have been averted in states that expanded Medicaid under the ACA, uh, the Affordable Care Act. In 2018, after implementation of the ACA, uh, there was an improvement in the cohort of reproductive age women um, who were uninsured or underinsured from 27 million, but it's in 2018, there still remained a large group of uh, women who were uninsured. And if we're talking about contraceptive care, the cost is a known barrier to access and use. So for example, long acting reversible contraceptives such as IUD and other implants have high upfront costs and are generally prohibitive without some form of coverage. 
So removing the cost barrier is one thing that could increase reproductive autonomy. Title 10 is um, a program that was created in 1970 that was really meant to address these issues. Um, Title 10 was created in a political landscape that probably none of us could even fathom today. Um, it was championed by uh, Congressman George H.W. Bush, signed into law by President Nixon, and was signed uh, into law with wide bipartisan support. And the goal was to address inequities in access to contraception and related reproductive health care. And it provides grant money to support a diverse network of providers offering uh, care. Most famously, we think of um, Planned Parenthood. Um, but locally, other examples uh, might include community health centers like Hope's Clinic or Community Health Alliance might be examples of providers who receive Title X funding, um, as well as state health departments. Um, Title X also contributes to training clinicians, um, patient education, insurance enrollment assistance, uh, the Planned Parenthood nearest where I trained um, during my residency training offered tutoring to students. So a wide variety of services. Um, Title X was intended to cover people living in poverty and those who are uninsured or underinsured. In 2018, Title X served 4 million patients. 65% had incomes at or below the federal poverty level. 40% were uninsured. 38% had Medicaid. Um, in 2016, 60% of women who received contraceptive care under Title X had no other interaction with the medical system that year. And I think this is a really important statistic. It really points out um, how critical this program is for this group. And um, you know, if you imagine a woman of reproductive age presenting to say a Planned Parenthood for contraceptive care, she probably also received screening for cervical cancer, possibly screening for sexually transmitted infections, screening for breast cancer if age appropriate, screening for intimate partner violence, so that this these programs capture a wide range of, of necessary care. Title X disproportionately serves patients of color. In 2019, 33% of Title X patients identified as Hispanic or Latino and 24% as African-American. There's no citizenship or documentation requirements for care and minors can access services without parental notification or permission. Um, however, uh, Title X has been sort of attacked from the beginning, um, most recently in the past administration. Um, Title X recipients are political lightning rods. I'm sure Planned Parenthood's one of the best examples there. Um, but also the program has been chronically underfunded. So if you look at the cartoon there on the right, um, if the original appropriation were adjusted for inflation, then Title X would be receiving about a billion dollars uh, annually today, but it's flatlined um, since about 2014 and it's only receiving less than a third of that. And then there are gag rules. So the sort of famous domestic gag rule was finalized in 2019 and the gag rule, um, I don't know if you can see it there on the right, mine's hidden by the pictures, but, um, Basically, recipients of the care or recipients of Title X funding must be physically separate, separate from all abortion related activities. So if you are going to accept Title X funding, then um, you could, for instance, only provide counseling on carrying a pregnancy to term and adoption. It essentially requires providers to refer all pregnant patients to prenatal care and prohibits providers from making referrals for abortion care, regardless of the patient's stated desires. Um, this is a direct attack on reproductive autonomy. So if you are a provider and you want to have integrity in 
reproductive care, then you basically had to pass on Title X funding after the gag rule and famously Planned Parenthood passed. And so after the gag rule, Title X networks capacity dropped by about half. And you can imagine that that affected a large number of patients. Um, I also wanna talk about how disparities affect access to abortion care. The first thing to remember is that behind every abortion is an unintended pregnancy. If our goal is to minimize the need for abortion, then we really need to focus on the racial disparities that we talked earlier. Well, not just the racial, but all of the healthcare disparities that we talked about earlier. We should emphasize education. We should emphasize employment opportunity. We should emphasize access to health insurance and um, to contraceptive care. Abortion is not rare. Uh, one in four cisgender women in the US will have an abortion in their lifetime. Um, patients who terminate their pregnancies include people of every race, religion, and socioeconomic group, and the majority are already parents. Um, however, 75% of abortion patients in the US are low income patients, and the majority are people of color. Abortion is legal in the United States. In 1973, uh, the US Supreme Court ruled the Constitution of the United States protects a pregnant woman's liberty to choose to have an abortion without excessive government restriction. However, legislation in several states has created a labyrinth of obstacles and restrictions that impede access to reproductive health care. And this places the greatest burden on communities already struggling to get by. Those already historically oppressed by structural inequities, um, including black and brown women, immigrants, and LGBTQ. Um, I wanna point out the hidden costs of abortion. So right, you see the average cost of an abortion at 10 weeks, $150. But there are um, hidden costs that include time off work, child care and transportation. And these are certainly going to be exacerbated by restrictions that make abortion more difficult to access. So if the state requires a waiting period, um, then that might make for more needed time off work. If you have to travel 30 miles to receive care or more or to another county or to another state, then certainly that's going to impose a, a bigger burden on things like childcare and transportation. Um, people struggling to pay for abortion report diverting money from other urgent needs, such as food and housing, and having to raise money for abortion often ends up delaying care and increasing the cost of that care. So the median cost of an abortion in the second trimester is two to three times more than in the first trimester. Again, health insurance increases access. So coverage can mean the difference between getting necessary abortion care and being forced to continue a crazy. And unfortunately about one in four who seek an abortion are forced to continue the pregnancy. This is again, a violation of reproductive autonomy and requires women to accept the risks of pregnancy and labor related complications, which women of color are already disproportionately negatively impacted by, um, as Denise will discuss. The negative financial impacts of denying abortion can persist for seven years, several years and actually generations. Um, compared with women who um, are denied the abortion they seek, um, they have four times greater odds of subsequently living in poverty and three times greater odds of being unemployed. And especially in states that are limiting education, um, childcare, cuts to food stamps and other safety net programs, um, this can be compounded. And this cartoon shows you can imagine an overlay between communities with higher um, states with higher concentrations of black and brown populations also have uh, 
policy landscapes that are more hostile to abortion. Uh, shortly after the passage of Roe v. Wade, the Hyde Amendment was passed and the Hyde Amendment withheld abortion coverage from people enrolled in Medicaid. Um, black and brown women are more disproportionate, are disproportionately likely to be insured through Medicaid. So in 2018, 31% of black women and 27% of Hispanic women of reproductive age were enrolled in Medicaid compared to 16% of white women. And again, these Medicaid enrollment patterns are themselves the legacy of um, oppressive laws and policies linking structural racism to social and economic inequality. And the burdens of the Hyde Amendment targets people who have been historically marginalized. Hyde reaches beyond just Medicaid. It includes uh, people who receive their insurance um, from the federal government. So federal employees, military personnel, veterans, Peace Corps volunteers, American Indian and Alaska Natives, um, those who are held in federal prison or detention centers. So I'm sure we can recall cases in the media of asylum seekers in detention centers who requested abortion care who did not receive it. And then women with disabilities that are enrolled in Medicare. Um, in 2015, there were a little less than a million women of reproductive age that were insured primarily through Medicare. States do have the option of using non-federal funds for abortion coverage and 17 states have legislation requiring abortion coverage for those enrolled in Medicaid, but Nevada is not one of them. And then we add to everything the effects of a pandemic. Uh, so 2020 brought the themes of racial health and economic justice to the forefront of the nation's consciousness, and these are relevant to reproductive health care and the myriad ways that systemic racism, classism, and discrimination affect if and when how patients get the care they need. During the pandemic, 34% of women reported wanting to delay getting pregnant or having fewer children because of COVID-19, and this was more, this was more often seen in um, populations of color. So 44% of black and 48% of Hispanic women. Um, my slide is cut off compared to a smaller number of white women. Um, at the same time, um, black and Hispanic women were more likely to experience delays because of the pandemic in sexual and reproductive health care. And then similarly, this effect was um, more pronounced in lower income women. So 37% wanted to delay compared to 32%. And again, a higher proportion of low income women had barriers to access during the pandemic. So it's important to remember that everything we talked about are policy choices. Um, that and priorities uh, that we have sort of made in policy in this country. And uh, reversing the damage will mean anti-racism as health policy. So the path forward, forward will require the current administration to use their platform to speak clearly and often about reproductive health justice and equitable access as well as ensuring that comprehensive access to reproductive health information and services is included in all relevant programs and policies. Um, the path forward will involve uh, beefing up Title X and making it the robust program that it was originally meant to be. Um, President Biden did send a memo to, and has repealed the gag rule. It's important to fund the program with emphasis on areas that lost funding due to the gag rule um, and to streamline the funding process. So there's um, lots of reporting that's required and it's cumbersome to receive Title X funding. So making that easier. 
as well as protecting providers, include provider non-discrimination protections in all regulations. Um, since Title X is a crucial source of care for marginalized populations, including low income patients, patients of color, immigrants, and youth, then services should center the needs and desires of those patients. Um, it's important that we don't take our, um, and we don't try to impose um, one way of providing care to communities who may uh, benefit from sort of different ways. And reframe the program from family planning, which is really more of like a heterosexual cisgendered term to sexual and reproductive health, which is more inclusive. And then lastly, I just wanna talk about some pieces of legislation, local and federal um, that are hopefully coming down the pike. And if you are a, you know, if you wanna get involved, you can support them or follow them. The first is the EACH Act, Equal Access to Abortion Coverage in Health Insurance Act of 2021. And it essentially reverses the Hyde Amendment, um, restoring abortion coverage to women who receive health care or insurance through the federal government. Um, it's important that health, that reproductive health care just be considered health care. It shouldn't be on the outside of discussions or policy um, decision making. It's just part of healthcare. And the EACH Act also would prohibit political interference with health insurance companies that offer coverage for abortion care. The Heal for Immigration Women and Families Act um, would enable lawfully present immigrants to enroll in Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program. The Women's Health Protection Act would establish a federal statutory right for providers to deliver and patients to receive abortion care free from medically unnecessary bans and restrictions. So this would be one of the first or recent um, like proactive piece of reproductive healthcare legislation instead of constantly having to be sort of reactive to anti-choice legislation. And then in our local legislature, we do have an assembly bill um, which would allow pharmacists to dispense self-administered contraceptives, which would decrease uh, a significant barrier to access. So, you can log on to NV Ledge and just click your support for this. And that's it for me. I'm gonna stop sharing. And while Denise puts up her slides, I'm gonna look in the chat box. Oh, there's nothing in the chat box. Hi everyone, is this showing up okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, thank you for coming. So um, I am going to speak about racial disparities along the reproductive continuum as well, but I'm, as Dr. Feshold said, I'm going to focus on maternal morbidity and mortality. So a small caveat before we begin, um, I am not, a subject matter expert. I am not um, first and foremost a person of color. I'm not a statistician. I'm not a social scientist. I am a clinician and I've watched the maternal mortality crisis receive more attention over the past few years. So I've gotten pretty curious, made some inquiries, reviewed a lot of sources and put together this lecture with the help of the real subject matter experts and you're all along for the ride. Um, one more word this time about gender. So most of the literature available about maternal morbidity and mortality uses the word woman. Um, I want to acknowledge all of the people who have pregnancies who do not identify as women here and now. But as I move through the research that I went through, you'll note that the language used by researchers is not always inclusive of trans or non-binary people. 
So I apologize in advance for this. Um, I've done my best to use inclusive language without misrepresenting the information provided in the studies that are available. So I will start by describing some of the racial disparities in maternal morbidity and mortality. Um, so maternal morbidity is quite simply um, injury, oops, excuse me, injury um, that a patient experiences during pregnancy, labor, birth, or postpartum. Um, maternal morbidity is 50 to 100 times more common than maternal death. Some of the more common examples of maternal morbidity or severe matern maternal morbidity include severe hemorrhage, eclamptic seizure, deep vein thrombosis, sepsis, pulmonary embolism, or bowel or bladder injury during cesarean section. And Black and Hispanic women are at significantly higher risk for maternal morbidity. Um, Data analyzed from 2002 to 2014 suggests that Black women actually have a 70% greater risk of severe maternal morbidity during their pregnancies and labors and births after adjusting for all cofactors. So I wanted to play um, a really great um, little documentary that you can find on YouTube. Um, it features Serena Williams, but I feared crashing Zoom, so I decided not to. Um, Serena Williams obviously is an internationally known tennis athlete, tennis star, and she experienced um, a severe maternal morbidity. She, um, I'm going to go back to this slide, um, and immediately postpartum, she developed difficulty breathing. She had a history of blood clots and pulmonary embolism, so she knew exactly what to ask for. She asked for a CT scan and anticoagulation. Um, and her nurse later reported that she thought Williams might have been a little loopy from the pain meds and she didn't call the surgeon who had done her cesarean immediately. So there was a delay and Serena Williams, yes, Serena Williams had to continue advocating for herself. The wrong tests were ordered, no meds were given and much, much later imaging confirmed that she was correct. and She had in fact diagnosed herself with another pulmonary embolism. Thankfully, this is a story of maternal morbidity and not mortality, but um, she has since that experience been very vocal in the media about giving voice to birthing people of color. Um, her argument has been, if this can happen to me, this can happen to anyone. So moving on to maternal mortality. Maternal mortality is quite simply pregnancy-related death. Um, we are talking about deaths that occur within one year of pregnancy. And of these deaths, one third occur during pregnancy, about half occur during labor or within the first week postpartum, and 13% occur between six weeks and one year postpartum. Due to variations in reporting and data collection, and we'll get into this a little bit later, it is possible that the number of pregnancy-related deaths, especially in the past, is underestimated and that the maternal mortality rate is much higher. Um, the data collection, the, the aspect of um, collecting deaths that occur within one year of pregnancy is actually fairly new. Um, the, we used to collect data um, out to only 24 days postpartum and anybody who had a complication past that was not considered part of these statistics. But part of the CDC's new maternal mortality reporting has included more people a year out and we'll cover that in a little bit more depth later. So maternal death outcomes by race. Um, about 700 women die each year in the US as a result of pregnancy or its complications. Now this in and of itself is a public health crisis. We are um, experiencing the highest rate of maternal mortality in the industrialized world. Um, but even more tragic uh, is the disparity in um, when we look at outcomes for people of different races. So American Indian, Alaska Native, and Black women are two to four times as likely to die from a pregnancy-related cause than white women. And this is information from the CDC. I apologize, the graph got cut off a little bit, but you can see um, that um, American Indian, Alaska Native, and Black women are the light purple and dark purple bars here. And, um, 
from this represents 2007 to 2016, but these numbers have been consistent for a lot longer than that. And from what we know now, the statistics have not changed drastically over the last couple of years. So as you can see, there is a range of cause for maternal death, including infection, um, previous cardiovascular conditions and cardio postpartum cardiomyopathy, pulmonary embolism like Serena Williams experienced, uh, cerebral vascular accidents, hemorrhage, and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are some of the more common causes of maternal mortality. Um, the important thing to know is that we are not just seeing that women of color have these complications and white women do not. What we see is that when women of color experience these complications, we are slower to act and their treatment is not as good and thus they die, whereas white women receive earlier and better treatment and they live. And because infant mortality is obviously tied into maternal health, I wanted to review some of the data on disparities in this area. So um, infants born to um, Asians and Native Hawaiians are twice, almost twice as likely to die relative to those born to white women. Um, the mortality rate for infants born to American Indian and Alaska Native women is nearly twice as high as those born to white women. Um, the mortality rate for Hispanic and Asian women is actually similar or lower than um, those born to white women. And the data also shows that fetal death uh, or stillbirth, which is pregnancy loss after 20 week gestation, um, are more common among black women compared to white and Hispanic women. So now I will move into the effect of racism on maternal health. I really appreciate this slide taken from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, at the top, you see basically, you know, as I think Dr. Freshholtz did a really nice job of painting the aspects of living in a society, right? Like what keeps us um, part of society and healthy. And then at the bottom of this slide, you can see the health outcomes that we're all very familiar with. Um, and then you see um, that rather than health outcomes being the direct result of many of these social determinants of health that I think most of us are familiar with, Racism and discrimination affects all of these aspects of living in society as a person of color. So this pathway, racism affecting people's income, people's support at work, housing safety and availability, access to good education, access to healthy food and healthy communities and good health care, therefore creates different health outcomes for different groups. Meaning it's racism, not class and not race. And it's both the risk factor and the cause of the disparity in maternal morbidity and mortality in this country. So as we move forward in this presentation, I want to point out that a lot of the data available, um, particularly in the social science text that I draw from is about black women. There's certainly research available about other groups, but as previously pointed out, the disparity in outcomes is the widest between black and white women. So um, there's been a lot of focus on that. And so much of what I'm going to review comes from that literature. So factors that do not explain disparities in maternal and infant health. I think very well-meaning people sort of try to explain outcomes, differences in outcomes based on socioeconomic status, prenatal health behaviors, insurance status, level of education, and those are all really, really important things to consider. And we have studies that can control for these um, factors, and we still repeatedly find racial disparity in healthcare. And in fact, um, when we take education, for example, um, as education levels and income increased amongst Black women, their outcomes actually worsened where these are um, protective among white women. And maybe we can uh, talk about why that is a little bit later. So um, Monica McLemore is a nurse researcher at UCSF, and she wrote an article for Scientific American, um, and it's it, I think it's called um, To Prevent Women from Dying in Childbirth, Stop Blaming Them. It's a really... Uh, good read if you can get a chance. So she writes, it's common to blame women for their own deaths. 
Many scientific publications have cited that women are coming to pregnancy older, thicker, and fatter. But even in studies that control for age, chronic disease, and obesity, the maternal mortality rate in the U.S. still far exceeds rates in similarly wealthy nations. So we're, I think most of us are familiar with the idea that there is uh, racial bias in healthcare. Some of the ways that they play out in prenatal care and care, um, interpartum care, as well as postpartum care, um, we see that there is a failure on healthcare providers' part and the healthcare system's part to educate um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color patients about early signs and symptoms of pregnancy complications. There is disbelief and delay in care when they report symptoms. You know, we can go back to Serena Williams' story to um, have an example of that. There are more errors and faulty communication on the part of the healthcare team when they are caring for patients of color. And there are simply more maternal deaths at hospitals that primarily serve women of color. Bias in healthcare and bias in virtually every other aspect of the fabric of social life affects people deeply. Um, and so we turn to the individual and racism's impact on health. Social scientists have written entire books on the two key concepts that I'm going to introduce. And as I said, I'm not a social scientist. My goal is to introduce the concepts so that people can put a finger on why racism in and of itself is so detrimental to people's health and health outcomes. So the first concept is called weathering, and this is something out of um, the University of Michigan. And you'll note this is from 1992, this is not new information. So weathering is a hypothesis that on a physiological level, um, a persistent coping with acute and chronic stressors has a perfect, profound effect on health. And Geronimus, the um, developer of this hypothesis, as the stress inherent in living in a race conscious society that stigmatizes and disadvantages blacks may cause disproportionate physical, physiological deterioration such that a black individual may show the mortality and morbidity typical of a white individual who is significantly older. So we have the hypothesis and then we actually have some measurements of what um, is called the allostatic load or the physiologic burden imposed by stress. So um, measurements have been made in the first category um, regarding substances the body releases in response to stress. So epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, DHEA. And then um, second category comprises the effects that result from the actions of those primary mediators. So you know, elevated blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, waist hip ratio. And again, I want to point out that these theories are not new. They've been around since the early and late 90s, respectively. So, you know, it's interesting that just in the last dec decade or so, we're really focusing on these racial disparities in medicinal health. So women of color experience the effects of racism as well as sexism throughout their lives. The prenatal period is known to be a source of significant stress for women of color. And this is, again, studied primarily in Black American women. Um, due to a longstanding history of abuse of Black people by the US medical system, many are distrustful of the healthcare system, providers included. And we know that they are also more likely to receive subpar prenatal care than white people. Um, during prenatal care, women of color have described ongoing power asymmetry with providers, and only 2% of OBGYNs surveyed in 2006 identified as Black women. So as Dr. Freshholds pointed out, very, very few people of color have a care provider who looks like them. Geronimus, the weathering developer, writes, racial differences in allostatic load scores are small in the late teens and early 20s, but they quickly widen beginning in young adulthood through middle age, and they're largest between the ages of 35 and 64 years. Black women of these ages suffer the highest probability of having a high allostatic load score, whether compared with black men or with white men or women. And sorry for all the quotes, but um, I, I found much of this to be um, more eloquent than I could write myself. Um, 
in social science literature, we see over and over again that Black women experience racism virtually everywhere, at work, in neighborhoods, in the media, and especially in healthcare. So this all converges on a Black person who is pregnant or thinking about a pregnancy. Um, media messaging has told the U.S. for a long time about single mothers of color on public assistance. Healthcare providers treat women of color as automatically high risk, and women know going into a pregnancy that they are at high risk of injury or death during pregnancy and childbirth. Um, these social scientists, Rose, Rosenthal and Lobel, write, Black American women are faced with two directly contradictory social pressures that in order to be real women, they should have children, and that as Black women, others resent when they have children and attempt to prevent them from doing so. This conflict represents a source of stress for Black American women that elevates emotional distress at any point in their lives as they consider the possibility of having children, and especially during pregnancy. Interestingly, um, when Black immigrants from the Caribbean and Africa are studied, they don't experience the same rates of adverse birth and other health outcomes as do Black Americans born in the U.S., but the longer that they live in the U.S., uh, the higher their likelihood of experiencing worse health outcomes. So um, now I'll describe current interventions to reduce maternal deaths and complications. <laughs> Another quote, this is from an article called um, Stolen Breaths, which is also really worth a read. Um, I think Dr. Freshholtz did a really thorough job outlining the efforts that we ne need to make as a society to increase uh, people of color's access to reproductive health care in general. So I'll focus on what's happening in maternal health specifically. So in data collection and legislative actions, um, the CDC has changed the pregnancy or actually elevated their pregnancy mortality surveillance system. As I said, they've increased the length of time that we consider a death, a maternal death from 24 days postpartum to a year postpartum. Um, there is, in 2018, there was a lot of attention given to the Preventing Maternal Deaths Act and this was passed. Um, Additionally, there is a national effort to create in all 50 states the Maternal Mortality Review Committees, and these are multidisciplinary committees to analyze root causes and make recommendations. And then there's a really interesting project in California, the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative, and this is a hospital-based racial equity pilot to reduce maternal morbidity and mortality. We don't have results yet. They should be coming this year, but there's a lot of attention being paid to this initiative because it's one of the few that sort of um, incorporates um, racial disparities directly into the interventions. We have some data that there are certain interventions that work. Um, there is evidence that wider access to a diverse team, AKA having providers who look like the patients that they serve, that this uh, improves outcomes and improves the patient experience. There's some information um, suggesting that access to midwifery care increase, or increases the likelihood that people are going to have good outcomes, particularly women of color. Along with that, group prenatal care and social and doula support, I think, you know, most people who are looking at this think that there's just something about having a witness to the care that that elevates the care. Um, there are lots of voices and organizations advocating for women of color. And I think we're finally getting the picture that if we want to improve health outcomes um, for people of color, their voices need to be central in creating the solutions. So the organizations that I listed to the left are acting, they're creating toolkits for allies, pushing legislative agendas on Capitol Hill, and enlisting healthcare workers to work alongside people of color rather than stealing the show. And I was pleased to see while researching for this talk that my professional organization, the American College of Nurse Midwives, has partnered with um, Black Mamas Matter, which is a community-based organization. And they're uh, raising awareness among midwives as well as pushing for a diversified workforce. And this is 
um, going through national legislation to allow for more money given to um, low income and people of color um, applying for uh, nursing school, midwifery school, uh, medical school, so that you know, patients quite simply have more healthcare providers that look like them because we know this improves outcomes. Uh, there are many statements coming out of the national uh, professional and healthcare organizations. So CDC, of course, American College of OBGYN, ACNM, and Kaiser Family Foundation. There's also been a lot of media attention on um, the racial disparities in maternal health. So PBS has done a quite a few series. ProPublica has done um, a lot of research and has a whole series. New York Times did as well a couple of years ago. And that's what this image is from. So within the healthcare system, again, Dr. Freshholtz touched on this. Um, we really need to make sure that we are incorporating the health, the knowledge about the health effects of structural racism into every level. So medical school, residency, uh, pursuit of licensure and ongoing accreditation. We need to desegregate the healthcare workforce. There needs to be implicit bias training for all. And I think Dr. Jacobs and her team have uh, made sure that that's available to all of us at the School of Medicine. Uh, Every Mother Counts is one of the organizations that has actually created an implicit bias training on their website for uh, particularly healthcare providers, but anyone who identifies as an ally who wants to help um, sort of dismantle any implicit bias that they are working with. And that's what we have. And I think we can open it up to questions. Thank you both. That was a fantastic presentation. And I don't know if you can see the chat, but there are a few questions in there already. Um, The first question is, um, uh, is it safe for pharmacists to write for oral contraceptives? Will they review contraindications? So yeah, pharmacists can go through the same checklist of risk and benefit um, discussion that providers Health, other healthcare providers do and um, sort of make a decision about whether oral contraceptives are safe for a particular patient. And then yes, probably nobody is better to review the contraindications than our pharmacists. Um, so it's, it's totally reasonable. Thank you. And I just want to note um, that in the chat, there are directions for folks that need CMEs as well as a link to the evaluation. Once you fill out the evaluation, it will give you the code that you need to actually claim your CMEs. Um, there is also uh, the slide deck itself has been uploaded. So thank you for sharing that. And then there is a question um, actually from me. Um, as someone who teaches our first year medical students, um, I see that in your presentation, you've talked a lot about um, educational intervention, societal types of things. What specifically would you recommend to um, our current and future physicians that they do differently during patient visits in order to reduce the disparities that you talked about and provide more equitable health care? I'll offer something. I don't think, I, I mean, I'm sure there's hundreds of things to do, but I would say, um, one of the things is, um, again, implicit bias awareness and training, just um, rather, I I think, um, and this is a larger uh, sort of topic, but certainly there's a lot of, um, no, not me, it's not, I'm not the problem. And rather than sort of focusing on their actions as being the problem or not being the problem, just being aware that, there, you know, to be anti-racist, we all need to acknowledge that this is very deep structural um, goo that we have to work through. And so if they walk in with that awareness, I think we're going to work better with patients. Yeah, I agree. So I would say, you know, just making sure that A, you're open to the concept of structural racism in our society as well as in our healthcare system. And also that you educate yourself on the history of how black and brown 
in our case, because we take care of women, women have been treated by the healthcare system and kind of what informs um, their perspective when they come to see a provider. So like, for instance, back on contraceptive care, I mean, there's research to suggest that um, providers tend to encourage black and brown women uh, towards LARCs, long-acting reversible contraceptives, more than white women. Um, and, you know, if, or if you're discussing sterilization with a Black woman, you need to be aware of, like, the history of abuse and eugenics that where Black women were sterilized against their will. So just kind of um, informing yourself and um, being open to, I think if you're always coming from a place of um, um, like mutual decision making, <laughs> then then that will help too. I'm blanking on the term that I want to use there, but patient centered. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. If there's any other questions, please um, put them in the chat. I I had a question um, regarding why is it? Do you think that more highly educated and higher SES African-American women experience even worse outcomes, whereas yeah, that, that protected. Yeah. For so women. yeah, um, that was of interest to me. And I mean, certainly this is not my theory. This is something that I read as I was preparing the lecture and um, in my own reading. But so the idea is that the if a black woman woman is you know, higher educated, working in a professional environment. Um, she is in environments with mostly white people. And mm -hmm. so the, her experience of racism in everyday life is actually increased compared to someone who is not surrounded by people that are not, who, who are not the same race as them. So the level of stress, the level of the allostatic load that we talked about is actually higher for someone who has to navigate um, a world that, you know, is not, is not populated by people who look like them. And so that increases the stress and in, in turn, their health outcomes actually worsen rather than improve. Interesting. That makes sense. Thank you. I don't see any other questions in the chat, but people are also welcome to unmute and ask questions. You're getting some thank yous and some <laughs> praise for this presentation. This, is, this has been such a thorough presentation, such a well-researched presentation. And I am so grateful to both of you for um, putting this together and bringing this important information to our attention. I, I see that there's a lot of physicians and a lot of our medical students who, by the way, are joining us during their spring break. So thank you to, to them and our physicians who are joining us during their lunch break. Um, so I really want to thank you both. Um, and I really want to thank everyone for uh, sharing, for attending today and sharing with this with us. Uh, again, CME information is in the chat. And for the Palm students, you can just upload your reflections to Canvas by Friday. And I still don't see any other questions, but lots and lots of thank yous. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Yeah, thank you, everybody. All right, thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.